In our evening services, we typically go through one of our confessions um, in the Heidelberg Catechism, and the confession that we are considering this evening, the teaching that we're considering this evening is uh, the fourth commandment, and it's summarized and taught um, and explained to us also in the Catechism. But I think we'll, we'll, what I'll do now is, is read the fourth commandment so that you remember it, and then we will continue with the question and the answer. So the fourth commandment goes like this, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And the catechism that we're considering is taken from Lord's Day 38. And I'll read the question, and I'd like you to respond with the answer. What does God require in the fourth commandment? We're going to consider then this teaching as we find it in the Word of God, and we're going to read a few passages this evening. We'll begin with Exodus chapter 23. If you want to open your Bibles, you can open your Bibles to Exodus 23, but it will also be broadcast on the board behind me. Exodus 23, verse 12. This is after the Lord came down on Mount Sinai. And shared the law. Now this is the summary of that. Exodus 23, verse 12. Six days do, you, do your work, but on the seventh day do not work, so that your ox and your donkey may rest, and so that the slave born in your household and the foreigner living among you may be refreshed. And I want you to take special note of the word refreshed there. Let us also move now into the fulfilling part of the Sabbath, the New Testament, and we'll go to Matthew, 20, Matthew 11. Just two verses there as well. Matthew 11, verse 28. Jesus is saying this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And finally, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for, we, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. I 
want to begin this evening with a few questions. I want these questions to resonate, hopefully, in your heart deeply. I want you to ask these questions. This is the first question. In what areas of your life do you find that there is no rest? Or I'll put the question another way. In what areas of your life do you feel that you need to be refreshed? Our life in this Western context is, is very, very intense in so many ways. In so many ways, we feel that we're on a treadmill. We got on this treadmill, and it's hard to get off. And there's work commitments and family commitments and debts to pay and kids to bring here and there and people calling us and, and the phone that doesn't want to stay silent. And you feel that you just... You just want to, to rest. You want to be still. Or maybe, maybe you're a younger person or older, or whatever the case may be, but you're kind of enslaved to what other people think of you. And so when you travel this world in cyberspace and social, plat social media platforms and, and you continue to track with people on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or whatever else and you look at your life and you compare their life and you feel that your life is just not quite as good, that you just don't match up, that their life seems a life worth living but your life, and you leave that Facebook or that Twitter account of yours or the Instagram and you feel empty and restless. Or, or maybe, maybe you're struggling with an illness or you've been diagnosed with an illness that might even be terminal. Recently, my wife met a woman at the Y, the YMCA in Burlington, and on one week she met her, she helped her with something, and the next week she, by God's providence, she met her again, an older lady. And this woman said to my wife, with much distress, she said, I just got news from my doctor. He says, I have a terminal illness and I'm going to die in five years. And then the doctor said, your last two will be absolutely miserable. Your body will just go stiff. And then the doctor said, we suggest that you consider doctor-assisted suicide full stop. Talk about a disquieted heart. What, what do you say to that? Or maybe you struggle with social anxiety. And places like this are actually very difficult for you. Your heart is so disquieted when you are, feel that you have to perform and meet people's expectations. Or maybe you struggle with depression. And that tunnel is so dark and it doesn't seem to have any light at the end. I was there for two years in that dark tunnel. And the lies that your brain constantly produces that, that life is not worth living, that life has no joy in it, that there is no hope in this life, that you're worthless, that you... And the lies continue. And some of you have walked this path of journey, this journey for 20 or 30 more years. And where, and where is that rest? And I have the audacity to put this theme up on the board. Rest and be refreshed in Christ. That's an imperative. And you will ask me, some of you will ask me this evening, you will say to me, is it that easy? Just rest and be refreshed in Christ. What if I said that to this woman? Just rest and be refreshed in Christ. Or someone struggling with depression, just rest and be refreshed in Christ. They'll say, really? I'm not here to give you a whole pile of cliches and simple responses to a hard life that some of you are living. But I'm going to let the Word of God do that tonight. And I'm going to ask another question from the Word of God. And that question is this. Is God concerned with the status of our soul and with our rest? Is God concerned with our 
well-being so that we are at rest and that we are still with him is he concerned about our sabbath and i mean by the word sabbath the internal sabbath of our soul is god zealous about that is he passionate about that is he is that important to god well let's just quickly walk through scripture in the, in the next 10 minutes i'm just going to walk through scripture to show you as many different ways as I can, that God is actually quite concerned with the status of your soul. And he wants your soul to be a soul of, to be a soul at rest. To be still. You see, when God created the earth, he created the earth in six days. He fashioned the world in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. That word to rest means to cease from work. He, the completed work of creation, the, the good work of creation was done, and he could cease from that, and he could rest from that. Exodus 31, verse 7, talks about God creating the world in six days, and on the seventh day, he not only rested, but he was refreshed. He was refreshed, and that idea of refreshment is that he could take a deep breath and, and celebrate in so many ways his created work. And, and there we find Adam and Eve. He gave them a charge to subdue the garden and, and protect the garden in so many ways. And that was a, a work. That was a job that they had to do. Work is not evil. But they could rest in this reality that God was in control, that he created a good and perfect world, a paradise that they could enjoy. And, and that's what they did. They were able to enjoy his rest by enjoying his creation. But they chose unrest. They wanted more. They thought maybe they could usurp God's authority and take control of this world. And so they ate the fruit and God drove them out. And as soon as they drew, were driven out, they were put on the treadmill. The treadmill of anxiety. The treadmill of fear. Of worry. Of looming death. Of sickness, of evil. Can you imagine the day that they received the report that their oldest son Cain killed their other son Abel? What happens to your soul when that happens? That your son is dead at the hand of another son. And yet Eve and Adam had received the promise in Genesis 3 verse 16 that, that from their seed, from their offspring, they would crush, someone from their offspring would crush the head of the serpent that there was someone to end this evil, this relentless disquietedness. That was the Messiah they were hoping, hoping for. And God then fashions a covenant with Abraham. And, and you know the covenant story that God says, I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. And I'm going to be with you. I'm going to bring you ultimately to a place of rest again. And so when his children ended up in Egypt... They were enslaved to the tyranny of work and the materialism that the pharaohs had to produce more and more and more and more and more in this life. God said, I'm going to rescue my people. And so he, he rescued them and he gave them the promise that they would enter a promised land called Canaan where they would be able to rest. Not ultimately, we know that because sin was still there, but this would be a land flowing with milk and honey, that there would be rest there. And on the way, of course, he gave them the fourth commandment. He gave them others. 613 other ones, or 612. But he gave them the fourth commandment for two reasons. The one reason was for physical health and well-being. That in six days you work, on the seventh day you rest. Because this is a way to say that your body needs to rest. But it was also a way to say that you are a contrast community. You are my community. You are defined by being able to let go of your work, not being a slave to materialism or self-sufficiency or anything like that, but you are my, my children. I will look after you. You work six days, you rest seven, and you let all that work stay till tomorrow. Don't worry about it. And if you do, you're not trusting me. And there was a death penalty to that. That's the external. The internal is this, that God knew his children needed a place for refreshment. A place where they can rest in his promises and rest in the reality that 
that God was in control, that they were not in control, and that they could trust him. Beside the word Sabbath, you have to put an equal sign to trust. Well, you know how the story goes. You know how the story goes. They didn't observe the Sabbath day. They didn't observe the, 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 the uh, seventh year rest that were supposed to happen and God sent them into slavery. But there was a passion. There was a cry throughout all of the Old Testament for this rest. You think of Psalm 23, verse 3. It says, you know, the Lord leads us beside still waters and he restores our soul. It's my soul in the singular there. It, that restoring is, he refreshes me. Psalm 55 or 6 says, Oh, that I could have wings like a dove and, and fly away. Why? To rest. This world is hard. This life is full of sorrow and pain. I, I want to rest. There was no rest. And then they went to exile and they came back and then Christ, and the Lord brought Christ into this world. The, the incarnate God, Son of God, came and dwelt among us. And what's beautiful about the incarnation is this, that almost immediately when Jesus commenced his ministry, he dealt with the Sabbath. He said things like this. He said, you know, man was not, the Sabbath was not, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for man. What does that mean? That in this connection between the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for our well-being, for the care of our life, both physically and spiritually. It was a gift. And then Jesus goes further. He says, and I actually, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I was there at creation. The whole world was created through me. This day was instituted by me. But I'm its Lord. And that means this, ultimately, ultimately, if you're going to find rest, you're going to find it in me. There is no, other, no one else. And that's why he could say to the Pharisees and to others around him who were struggling, was, the Pharisees were putting the people of Israel into, into this um, relationship of, of suffering and, 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 and carrying heavy yokes and a heavy burden by all the laws. I think they call it the halakha, the laws and the customs that they had formed around protecting the Sabbath day. And they were burdening God's people. And Jesus says, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And I'm gentle because I am gentle at heart. And I'll give rest for your soul. And for that to happen, for Christ to say, really, the Sabbath is all about me, and if you want to find rest, you need to find rest in me. For that to happen, he had to secure the salvation of everyone who comes to him. There is no way for us to have rest apart from Christ on the cross, suffering our unrest. And that's what he did. And that's where he ended his life. He ended it on the cross. He came to the cross, the place, the most restless and disquieted place in all the earth, in the whole story of creation and redemption. We have the cross, a place of torment, a place of deep sorrow, a place of deep unrest and disquietedness. And Jesus there, bearing the burden of our anxiety, our misery, our sin, our pain on that cross as God unleashed his wrath upon him. It says in Revelation 14, verse 7, that the torment or the smoke of the torment of those who are in hell go up forever and ever. And then it says this, and there is no rest, neither day nor night. The picture of hell is the opposite of Sabbath. The picture of hell is a restlessness and a disquietedness that never ends. And for Jesus to secure our rest, 
He had to bear our unrest. He had to bear our hell. He had to bear the, bear the torment, the pain of hell. And as he did, his father turned away. And so we have in Psalm 22, verse 2, it says, I cry out to God. I cry out to God by night, and he does not answer. And it says, by day, it says, I cry out to God by day, he does not answer. And by night, I find no rest. Jesus fulfilled those words on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I cannot find any rest here. There is no peace here. There's no hope here. There's no quietness there. And he cried out to God. Well, Jesus accomplished that. He fulfilled the Sabbath. He rose again. On the first day of the week. And on the first day of the week, the church said, this is the day that we celebrate his completed work of salvation. And on this day, we come together and worship him. And that's where our catechism begins. Our catechism begins in this pursuit of worshiping him in the hope of finding rest, in the reality of finding rest. Hebrews 4 verse 11 says, strive to enter his rest. There is in us a reality that we have to strive to enter this rest. And part of that striving to enter this rest is to come together and to, to be filled up with his promises and his hope and his joy and be refreshed by his word. And that's why the catechism does this three-part thing in it. First it says we need to maintain this place. There needs to be a place where you can come together every single Sunday and be refreshed by God's word. If We're going to talk about this next Sunday, but if we're not supporting this cause, if we're not supporting the preachers, if we're not supporting the building, we're not supporting this place where we can gather together, we're not striving to enter this rest. This is a place, this is a place where God says, I want you to share the gospel of my rest to my children. This is a place that we preach Christ and him crucified so you, you will have rest for your souls. The second thing that this this catechism says, it says now that you've maintained this place, that there is a place for you to worship together on Sunday. When you come together, make sure that you, you, know, you, you hear God's word, you use the sacraments, we publicly call upon his name, and we give Christian offerings. These are all ways to grow us up and to be refreshed in the goodness and the love of God. God cares about your soul, so come and assemble together. That's Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. Don't give up meeting together, as some of you are in the habit of doing especially as the day draws near. Come together, be refreshed, encourage each other, because this life is hard, and your souls are disquieted. And finally it says, each day you need to rest from your evil works. You know, one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why our souls are so disquieted is because we have far too many idols in our life. Far too many things that are distracting us from what really, really matters. It doesn't really matter what your friends think about you. Really. It doesn't really matter if, if you have the latest and the coolest clothes. It doesn't really matter if you're well networked. If you have lots of friends. It doesn't really matter if you have that trailer that you wanted to buy and you're working extra hours so that you could buy a trailer to go camping. Those, those dis become distractions. One of the things that we have to do is put to death all the idols in our life so that Christ becomes our all in all and that we are fully satisfied in him alone. Not in all the trappings of this life, but in Jesus. And finally, I'm going to close with this. Of putting to death all those that evil and, and trusting in the Lord. There's two realities there. One is just to come into the open arms of Christ and say, admit your failures, admit your sins. 
Admit that you can't go on in your own strength. And just trust that he will carry you. It's like a child. If I pick up my daughter Ava, she knows that I, when I pick her up and hold her, that I'm not going to drop her. She's not even thinking about that. And as I pick her up and hold her, she can sleep on my shoulder. Why? Because she trusts that I'm going to care for her. That's our Savior. And you come into his open arms. I want to finish with one last illustration. This is for those who are struggling in the seas of depression, anxiety, worry, fear. In Papua New Guinea, when we had to go to a village church, one village church in particular, we had to cross a river that was one of the main rivers in at least our area. It's a massive river. It's about a kilometer wide. This is the tropics where you get five meters of rain a year. You get big rivers there. And you have, in this crossing, you'd have water and a bit of dry land and then water and then dry land, but in the crossing, between these kind of dry, dry parts, we'd have kind of deep guts, gutters out and deep areas of, of, of water that, and the torrential waters would just come rushing down. And, and the waters were so fast And this happened more than once where parents would be trying to cross these waters. And they would slip and the child would slip off their shoulders and there was no way to rescue them. In one second, that child is already 20 feet down the water. That fast. Well, when the water was up that high, we generally wouldn't take our kids across the water. And so during the dry season, the water was up to about here. But during the wet season, the water was up to about here. I could not cross that water on my own. I had to hold the arm with all I had to the, to the leadership of the church, to people that knew the water. And they would navigate that water for me. And I would walk with them. And so would my older children if they came with me, if the waters were high. And I learned two things there. The first thing I learned is that I had to keep in stride with him. I had to keep walking. He, he couldn't drag me. That would be too difficult for him. I had to keep in stride with him. As you're walking through this water, knowing that this water could just take you and just send you down three or 400 kilometers to the sea, you better hold on. And walk in stride. But the other thing I realized, that even if my grip started to get a bit loose, he wouldn't let me go. His grip was hard and strong, and he would navigate this water, and we would end up on the other side, and I would say, thank you. And he'd act like it was nothing. It's like, yeah, you're welcome. I'm going to tell you tonight, that your Savior has navigated the waters that you are in, whatever those waters might be. Your Savior knows them. He knows them better than you. He endured their ugly torment on the cross for you. I'm going to tell you tonight that, yes, you need to strive to enter the kingdom of heaven. Yes, you need to strive to enter his eternal rest. Walk in step with him. Walk in stride with your Savior. And know this, that he will never let you go. Ever. You're too precious to him. Your well-being is his purpose for coming. And he's going to see it through. That you can enter into his eternal rest and be with him forever. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you give us rest. We thank you that you're zealous for our rest. And we believe, Father, that when we are at rest and we are still, when we are satisfied in you, you receive the glory. 
You are most glorified when we are most satisfied in you for what you have done. And we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the story of the Sabbath. We thank you for the rest that Jesus acquired for us. And we thank you, Lord, that he brings us into eternal rest. And that's not a place of absolute inertia. That's a place of resting in your work and realizing, Lord, that as we work in glory, as we celebrate you in glory, we will be in a place where there will be no evil, that we will enter no tread, we will have to enter no treadmill, that we will be at rest. Lord, if there's anyone here tonight with a deeply disquieted soul, with a deeply restless soul, we pray that they will come to you, you who have the arms that can hold them. They'll rest in you, trusting that you will navigate the path forward and that you will bring them to their home, ultimately. That you'll be with them. Help us all to rid our lives of the idols in our life and just hold on to Christ and walk in stride with him by the Holy Spirit, knowing that you're taking us to a better place. In Jesus' name, amen.